Hello and welcome. I wanted to give a quick overview of the tools that I used when I did my IMS project. This will just be a quick review of what worked and how I did things. The specific details of each of the special tools that I fabricated will be up on my blog. So if you're actually making these tools, you'll want to check that out. But if you're just curious about the general process, this should give you a quick overview. So I was able to successfully replace the IMS bearing in my 986 Porsche without purchasing any special tools. That saved me a lot of money, maybe took a little bit of extra time, but uh, other than that, there wasn't much of a downside. So we'll start with the tool that I used to remove the IMS bearing itself. I used a piece of metal conduit uh, a hardened nut and bolt with some washers that went on like that. And then right here I rented a pilot bearing puller, which I don't have because I rented it. But you can see how it all fits together on my blog and also in the video where I do that. This pulls the bearing out by actually grabbing hold of the bearing instead of grabbing hold of the center bolt. I believe the Ellen engineering tool actually grabs hold of the center bolt and that's what I tried to do first. I don't think it's a very good system. Pilot bearing puller is definitely the way to go. So this worked really well once I got it all sorted. The dimensions and details for that are again up on my blog. Related to that is the rear main seal installing tool. This is just a PVC cap that I drilled four holes in. I used the bolts that attach the flywheel to tighten down this tool and press it into place and I cut a depth gauge on there so that I could measure and make sure that the rear main seal was sunk down at the right depth. This worked pretty well, but if I had to do it over again, I would cut a notch like this to measure the depth. I would cut at least a few more so that I could measure the depth all the way around and make sure that it's going in straight because it's very difficult to get that rear main seal in straight. Again, dimensions for this tool up on my blog. Next, camshaft locking tools. These are perhaps the most overpriced tools out there because they are literally just a piece of steel with a notch and a hole cut in it. Super simple. If you have a grinder, you can get a bar of steel and cut one of these out. The way I did this is I took my bar of steel and I held it up against the motor where the camshaft was and I just marked this spot right here where it had to fit in and then started cutting around and kept checking it until it fit in correctly. So that also worked really well. All right, that leaves us with the big ones. Next up, floor jack. I did do this entire project on jack stands and having a good floor jack was really useful for that. This floor jack can lift the car up to about 20, 21 inches, somewhere in there. And that gave me enough clearance on the jack stands to get under there and get the transmission out. I also used the same jack stand to lower the transmission. They do make special transmission jacks to lower transmissions, but I found that that wasn't actually necessary. Instead, what I did is I just removed this and I just bolted a board to the top of my jack to stabilize things and then I strapped the transmission onto this board and that worked well. Of course, with a lot of things that I do, there might be some risk associated with this. Obviously, you never want to be undo your transmission as you lower it and you do kind of want to be careful when you're building something that's going to hold a fair amount of weight like that. It worked well in my experience, but I did bolt this down to my jack, so it was pretty stable. On the topic of a jack, this right here is just an official hockey puck, which it turns out is just really tough rubber. 
and it works great as a jack pad when I'm jacking up my car so that the metal here doesn't cut into it or bruise anything. So I just put that on there like that. Works really well. Uh, hockey pucks are super cheap, so it's a great option for a pad. The last tool right here is the bar that I used as an engine support. Uh, they do sell engine support bars that work well and they're pretty reasonably priced. So if you don't happen to have a heavy steel bar laying around, it might be worth it just to buy an engine support. But in its essence, an engine support bar is really just a heavy steel bar, a chain, or in my case, I used a turnbuckle that will hook on to the engine and support the weight. And then uh, on the ends, I just used a couple of hardwood door jams uh, to support the steel bar. And it worked really well. I've also seen people use jacks on the underside to hold up the engine as they're working on it. Uh, I don't know that I'd recommend this. I haven't tried it and it apparently does work, but I would be concerned because as you're working on the engine, the engine has a tendency to rock a bit. And I'd be concerned that if the engine's supported on a jack stand or on a jack, it might get knocked out and your engine would <laughs> the back part of your engine would fall down and break something. So um, I feel like that's probably not as good a way as hanging it from the top on an engine support bar like this. Um, either way though, you do need to support it because once you take the transmission out, the transmission jacks were supporting the back half of the engine and when they're gone, that part of the engine is kind of just hanging. So it's gotta be supported somehow. This worked well, uh, but again, if you do something like this, make sure you're confident that you can do it in a way that's strong enough. This bar is pretty thick steel, and I was confident it would work, and it did. But if you don't have something that you're confident in, just go ahead and buy an engine support bar. Again, there are more details about this system that I used as well as a link to some of the engine support bars that you can buy if you check out my blog. So I believe that's every special tool I made. Again, I didn't have to buy any of the special tools. They're really overpriced and I found that they were completely unnecessary. So I saved a pretty good amount of money by just making my own tools. It wasn't difficult and it worked well. Most of the other tools I used were pretty standard sockets, wrenches, things like that. I did buy a few general tools for this project. One of those was a digital torque adapter. Uh, I've used the click torque wrenches before and I've never really been happy with them because I feel like they don't really get things that accurate and it's hard to tell when they're torqued correctly. The digital torque adapter worked brilliantly. This is a 3 8 inch torque adapter and it had the right range to torque pretty much all of the bolts on the project. I did also have to buy a hardened impact rated torque socket. This is the T55 torque socket that I used to tighten the flywheel bolts. Those flywheel bolts are on there so tight that a typical torque socket just isn't strong enough and I wore out my old one. So make sure you have a hardened impact ready one for that job. Related to that, I did also buy a longer breaker bar, a longer, stronger breaker bar. This is a 24 inch breaker bar, I believe. My smaller breaker bars were just not quite cutting it and I was actually afraid that I would break them. Uh, so this held up really well. And last, I bought a pair of snap ring pliers. I did have some snap ring pliers, but they were kind of small and janky. These were large enough and strong enough to squeeze the snap ring into place when I was installing the IMS bearing. So they worked out really well as well. All right, so that is absolutely it for IMS related stuff. I'm saying that now, but 
watch, I'll probably post something later. Um, but as far as I know, that's it. If you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment and uh, we'll see you guys around.